the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this place that we can come to and for this haven of safety, Lord, and just that we can stand before you and, and find rest. Pray, Lord, that you would um, just be here with us tonight, Lord, and speak words of truth and words of comfort and words of grace into our hearts and our minds. Pray that you would inspire Father Vijay as he comes to us tonight, Lord, to, to lift us up and, and to sharpen, sharpen us with his words, Lord. Hear us as we pray, thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those trespass against us. Lead us not temptation, but the first and the evil one. Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is kingdom, the power, and the glory. All right. I know the, the vast majority of you know Father TJ, so I will do a quick introduction. Um, oh, that's beautiful. Very nice. So we are really blessed uh, tonight uh, to have with us Father VJ Thomas. Uh, I know many of you know Father VJ from the One Conference and from some of our retreats and some of their retreats. And um, So I know he's a familiar face and a familiar name and person for, for many of you who are here. Uh, this is your first time um, to, to be with Father VJ. I think you're in for um, a blessing and really I uh, heard him myself speak and just very encouraging. Um, I think what's more encouraging than, than that is just the fact that we're, we're here together. Um, and that is a big part of what, you know, I think started just a few years ago is really th this effort to say, let's, you know, let's, let's, we are brothers and sisters, but let's live that way and let's, you know, get together and, and learn from each other's experiences. So, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. If you could just welcome uh, Father Vijay serving at St. Gregorio, St. Basilius Gregorius in North Plainfield, New Jersey. So thank you for making the, the truck out from Jersey and please welcome him. Thank you, Abuna. It's definitely a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is, I guess, my second time coming to, to this Bible study specifically. Um, and sorry, let me just here. So uh, do I? I don't need to wear this, right? We're good. Okay, perfect. So um, today, I know who has finals. Who, who's done with their finals? Raise your hand. Glory to God for that, right? <laughs> who's who? Who still has finals to go? Okay. <laughs> and 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 uh, who's just enjoying being a senior in high school? Just a few. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> good time to be. Um, anyway, tonight, I guess, I don't want to take, I know that there's many who have to study at the same time. I know that, um, you know, it's, it's December times, it gets kind of busy, so I don't want to take too much time with, with um, so the Bible study isn't as long as I would usually do it. We'll see how long it goes. But the idea is, tonight, and when we're in this place, we're going to focus on the scriptures. And um, the topic, I believe it's a six-week lecture. Uh, I'm not sure where I fell in place of the six weeks. I'll number three. So, The Word Became Flesh is the, is the lecture series. And uh, tonight, I'll be talking to you guys about the angels communicate with men without fear. And this is from the Nativity Sermon of St. John Chrysostom. So, um, first off, uh, who has seen me do a Bible study before? Okay, just a few of you. All right, uh, the only reason I do this is because it makes it easier because I'm not your usual Abuna. Um, uh, not, I mean, Abuna Michael and I are very uh, similar in, the, in certain ways, but the idea is I don't like to lecture. The reason being is because I'm not as smart as, as Abuna Michael. Um, <laughs> but uh, the thing is, um, I, I want us to interact. So when, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at certain scriptural passages, and I need everyone here to chime in and tell me exactly what you're thinking. It can be off the wall, it can be anywhere, but it'll be fun. Because when we work together, we're two or three are gathered in my midst, who's there? Christ. Christ. See, see, that's the whole participate part of this. <laughs> when I say who's there? Christ. Christ. There we go, wonderful. See, there we go. Now, uh, so we're gonna go forward and let us, so 
to try to understand what we're talking about today, um, the key phrase that we need to we're going to be talking about today is this, is this phrase: "Do not be afraid." And so, the word "became flesh" is all about incarnation, right? The incarnation. Can anyone define the word incarnation for me? Define the word incarnation. Okay. The word became flesh. The word became flesh. So, but incarnation would mean basically something becoming bodily, right? Coming down. Well, it, the idea of um, the incarnation is we're talking about Jesus Christ, the Son becoming a human being. So, this phrase, do not be afraid, how is it significant to the incarnation? That is the question I want to answer today. And I have an idea, and I have my opinion on what that, what that is. Now, um, when St. John Chrysostom is writing this, he's talking about, he was talking about how a miracle it is that angels communicate with men without fear. And this shows that Jesus Christ is born. Okay? So, this phrase, do not be afraid, what is significance. <coughs> Do not be afraid is used four times, right? In the scripture. So it's this, this phrase, do not be afraid is a very, very uh, a phrase that's used over and over again. So it's used with Zechariah. Who's Zechariah? Anyone? Zechariah? Father of St. John. John. The Baptist. Then there's, it's used with Mary, it's used with Joseph, and it's used with the shepherds. And who says this phrase? The angels. The angels. Um, okay, so the angels say it, and um, the angels are saying this phrase to these four people. And it's the exact same phrase said over and over and over again. So why? That's the question we want to ask. Um, and there has to be a significance for it. See, when you study scripture, the one thing that you have to realize is when something's repeated over and over and over again, it's done that way because it's, they're trying to like hit it into you. They're trying to like get you to really realize it. Um, it's like when you try to teach there's a, there was a bunch of little kids here before, and they were all running around going crazy. And you could go tell them, like, be quiet, stop, like, sit down. What's going to happen the first time you say it? Are they going to do it? No. <laughs> and they're going to have to do it again, and do it again, and do it again, until hopefully they get it. And, but repetition teaches us something. So there's something very important to be learned here. Okay, so... What I'm going to do now is I'm going, to, I'm going to show you the passage in which the angel talks to Zechariah. We're going to read that passage very quickly. It's a very short three verses. And when we read it, I want you guys to think, just figure out why is the angel saying, do not be afraid. So in Luke 1, St. Luke chapter 1, verses 11 to 13, it says, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense, and when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. All right. Thoughts about why does the angel say, Do not be afraid? So, so say for example, right? Uh, all right, it's not 
100% known, because um, it's disputed, but within the tradition, it said that Zechariah was not only going to offer incense, he, he was sent to offer incense um, in, at one of the altars, but it's late, in, in later, like for example, Ephraim will say that it was into the Holy of Holies that he had gone to offer the incense. And so this was, that was actually a big deal. Like that means that he was high priest that year. Um, so now he's in the Holy of Holies and he walks in and what should you find there? An angel, right? So you should be like, hey angel, see I knew you were going to be here. Or, you know, the thing is, you see, uh, just think about it. Who, who, who serves in the altar? Who's, who's a, ser- a servant in the altar? Anyone? No one? Any of you guys? Yeah, you guys have them. All have them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everyone here is. Um, so, uh, and when you go to the Armenian churches, you have to be careful because actually women serve uh, as, as deacons. I'm not careful, but that's actually a really cool thing. But anyway, um, <laughs> so a little aside. So, anyway, the. Um, I don't know, if I were to enter the altar, right, um, and I'm going into the Holy of Holies. You guys understand what the Holy of Holies is, right? The Holy of Holies was a place that humanity only entered how many times in a year? Once. So you only enter it once. And now, what's in the Holy of Holies? What's in the Holy of Holies? The Ark of the Covenant. What's on the Ark of the Covenant? Like, when you look at the Ark of the Covenant, what's going on there? Anyone know what's, on, what's the top going on? There are two angels covering it. So yeah, you know, angels are potentially going to be there. But this guy, he... Okay, you're going in to pray. And you want to meet God when you pray. Zechariah was able to see the angel. But his fear fell upon him. Any other, other any ideas? What do you think? Maybe he's telling him I have good news, not bad news. Good news, but not bad news. Okay. What do you mean by that? Um, instead of thinking that uh, he's coming to kill him. <laughs> he's coming to kill him. No way. No one. No, no. No answer is a bad answer, right? <laughs> I feel like I'm way too familiar with what the Holy of Holies is. Okay, so the Holy of Holies is basically where they kept the Ark of the Covenant. It is the place of holiness. Like basically, like it, you only enter it once. You, it's a, uh, it's you worship. Um, like the the holiest of things are kept there, and um, so there are there angels there normally. Well, for example, do you remember the pillar of cloud that would 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 rest upon uh, the tent of the covenant? That was the thinking that there was God there. Like when you're going into the holy of holies, God is there. Like that's how holy of holies it is. It's a fo- it, 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 it's a place of of um, where heaven and earth meet in a way. It was a place of fire because. If you went in and you were not worthy, then you know you potentially could get harmed. Uh, harmed. <laughs> so saying that he was going to die is is actually not too off. Why would Zachariah think that he was in trouble? What about Zachariah that we know? What do we know about him? What, what was going on with him? What was different about him? <coughs> Brandon? Huh? The question. What is different about Zachariah? Like what what do we know about him that would make him feel like he like he should be afraid? Isn't he starting to doubt at this point after all his prayers? Doubt what? That, that God could bring him children, a child. Okay, so he's starting to doubt God. But what about him not having a child? What does that say about him? Hmm? I'm hearing something. Yeah, this was, this was. 
Huh? Someone said about him. What'd you say? He doesn't believe. Huh? He said he's cursed. He's cursed. Perfect. He's cursed. All right. No, no, no. Because think about this, right? Um, do you remember that, that parable? Not the parable, but... Do you remember when uh, the the Pharisees came to Jesus and the uh, Pharisees or Sadducees? I'm not remembering exactly, but they came to Jesus and said, "Here's a man. He, he was blind from birth. Who sinned? His father or his mother? Right? What does that thinking tell you? That thinking tells you that if something bad happens to you, you did something wrong. Right? So, what's bad in Zechariah's life? He hasn't. He has no heir. He has no child. He is childless. So what does that mean about Zechariah? God doesn't love him. Something's going wrong. He did something. He has some great sin. And if you walk into the holy of holies with sin, you know, and then you see an angel, what do you think? It's coming to kill him. Coming to kill me. <laughs> you gotta be scared. Sorry, <laughs> but but the, 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 the truth is, the truth is, Zachariah has a fear, and that fear is a fear that a lot of us have, and that fear is one thing: a fear of our unworthiness. A fear of our unworthiness. I um I heard a story uh, in so in our liturgy and in the Indi- Indian Orthodox liturgy as well as the Syrian Orthodox liturgy um, the the curtain will close and 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 actually all the the deacons and uh, the the acolytes will stand um, in front of the altar blocking any view of the altar at, at one certain part and that what that part is is. We call it the Gandapa Sushusha, which means it is the breaking of the bread. It's when we symbolize that Christ is, is broken on the cross. And we actually break the bread. Now, it's probably like, you know, I mean, the whole liturgy is a solemn po- time. But this one time is very, very solemn. And so, um, the one thing that always gets me, um, there's a story of a priest, an uh, Indian Orthodox priest, who went went and became a, well? He became a priest, but he never he never had a real heart for priesthood. He was a great singer. He was you know one of those good speakers, but he just didn't have. He didn't even he didn't care. He just he just did everything because like oh he chants so well and and the women were like oh wow he's such a you know good looking guy and and so he loved the fame of being a priest, right? Yeah, famous priest. <laughs> Uh, but okay, so then what happens to him is he's, he's doing the service. He's like, oh, whatever, okay, whatever. And at this point, you know, the solemn occasion when all the people are singing and, they're, and, and he is doing these special silent prayers and breaking the bread, what happens is the craziest thing. When he breaks the bread, from the bread, blood flows out and they cover his hands and he falls down in front of the altar now all the acolytes and the deacons were like what's going on and they didn't, they didn't see exactly what he saw this priest to this day tells this story about how his life was changed because God put the fear into him and he realized his own unworthiness and so when I stand up to serve, it's, it's that kind of fear, a fear of unworthiness, like, oh, something bad going to happen? And so that same fear is a fear that Zechariah had, that am I worthy to go, to go meet God? Am I worthy, and is something bad going to happen? You know, within the liturgy, when, when you partake of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, it's stated we, that we, we, may, we, we hope that this is not for our condemnation and punishment, but for our life and our redemption, for our salvation. And so there's this fear of unworthiness. So that's Zechariah. Who was the second person who had the phrase, do not be afraid? Mary. So Mary 
She, in, in St. Luke chapter 1, verses 28 to 30. The same way we did it before, let's do this. So I want you to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it, and I want you to think about what is she afraid of. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. And considering what manner of greeting this was, then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Thoughts? What do you guys think? What's going on here? Okay, yeah. That's true. Okay. Let's go back one second. So he was troubled, and fear fell upon him, and then she was troubled at his saying. Okay. Isn't it like both similar fears, fears of unworthiness? Because Mary might not feel that she's worthy to be the one that's the vessel of Christ that carries Christ. It's it, her humility is a big thing. Yeah. Huh. Um. I'm. I'm thinking like at this point she's she's not like uh, connected with a man or anything, so she's like taking stone or killed again. So well, she doesn't well, know. I guess, I guess she doesn't know yet at this point, right? Okay, so I'm but I'm guessing but, like, the yeah. fear, like the overlying fear of the whole moment. I guess. So. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just yeah. thinking maybe the fear of responsibility. I mean, Saying blessed are you among women, highly favored one, like that carries such a weight of responsibility. Yeah. yeah. And that can be that that's overwhelming. Right. You feel like you're you know you have such You're a placed up there and you're like, oh, can I can I hold on to that or can I can I live up to that? I mean th- again, none of these are wrong. Is it, this is this is us coming together to try to figure this out. I have an idea of what I, I was thinking it was. And uh, I think what you're all saying is, is dead on. George wants to say it. What do you want to say? <laughs> she was afraid she was going to die? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, as Orthodox, we don't accept that translation rejoice. Highly favored is wrong. We should say full of grace mm-hmm. as Orthodox. Because uh, that's a great grace for Mary to be a mother of God. Yeah. So that's a huge thing that cannot be accepted intellectually or as a human being. It didn't happen to anybody before to, to receive that kind of grace. Uh-huh. So she was shocked uh, uh, of the amount of blessing and grace that she is receiving or announce it by the angels. Right. But she was believing. She is different from Zachariah. Zachariah was not believing. Right. But she was believing that this could happen. Mm-hmm. Okay. The, I think you're you're right. Exactly. There there is a difference between her and Zachariah, and um, the idea that she. She's raised this, this place. I mean, we, we, we often hear of Mary's humility, so that, that's, that's a key, key concept. The, the one thing, okay, just from, a, I mean, this is in left field, but, and this is not what I was thinking, but ju- you know, just to, to get our, our thoughts going, um, picture this. Young woman, approach out of nowhere, guy comes up to her going, Hey, highly favored one, what's going on? Blessed among women. <laughs> what are you thinking? What did I do? <laughs> <laughs> proposal. Yeah. <It's> a proposal. <laughs> <It's a> proposal. <laughs> proposal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, especially you know, you, if you walk down the street and 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 and, and you run into a, a person who is talking to you in such a, a in such a way that they have like this deep affection for you, it could be scary, right? I mean, especially, I mean, for a young woman of that time, of course, even for today. So she's troubled by, you know, what is this guy talking to me? I know, for example, in Indian culture, 
I mean, this is this is this is you know this is the the old country, right? And so in in the old country, men and women really don't talk. You know, I don't know. Maybe in Egypt it does. I, but in India, like guys hold hands because they don't talk. <laughs> It's really bad. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Egyptians do something. See, exactly. But the reason being, yes, exactly. No, we do, we do the same thing. But the reason being is because it's not appropriate for a man to talk to a woman. And I mean, how Gabriel looks is is, is interesting. So we have to. We, we don't know exactly, but that's a possibility. Angels have no gender. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. If you, if you. So, but okay. What to to just you know to get past what I was saying before to give you guys what I was thinking was what was Mary's fear. Well, what I think Mary's fear was, and this is completely my opinion, is that she was troubled at a saying and consider what manner of greeting this was, and then the angel said to her, "Do not be afraid." Mary is. She, in her humility, yes, she's you know, she's kind of thrown back by this, but more than that, she she had a fear of one thing, and that was a fear of the unknown. She had a fear of the unknown, meaning that she didn't know what what is this what is this guy saying? What is this what what is what is this saying that's being brought to me? She doesn't comprehend it at the time, so she has this fear of the unknown. And the angel is trying to calm her and tell her, don't worry, God is in control, right? Okay, let's keep going so we can get through this. Joseph, Matthew, St. Matthew chapter 1, verses 20. Joseph, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. What's Joseph's fear? Is it the same thing? What do you mean? Is it fear of the unknown? Potentially, yes. Could. Okay, so it's not. No, no, no. No, it's, 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 it's all along that track. It's all along that track. What else? Any other thoughts? Joseph, what are you afraid of? I mean, if, if Joseph didn't um, like consummate their betrothal, then somebody might have. Okay. Okay. Right? All right. So then, what what is what's his dilemma right then? Like to either expose her, or you know, I, I mean, by that time he he knew that she that she was like, with child. Yes. Correct? Yeah, he knew her, she was a child. So then, what's his dilemma? So he's supposed to take her as kind of like a daughter figure, and and not, and he's not, he's technically not married to her yet. So to have, well, I, I had heard the story that he's not, he's not actually, they're not intended to be married at all because of the age disparity. And so the fact that she's now pregnant, people are going to think that he did that. I'm not no. sure. I don't know about that. Dude. Okay. Uh, I think it's the fact that he's taking being him like being a lot older. He's taking a uh, a lot younger girl who's already pregnant. So it's kind of like something. Okay. So well, what's the social issue here? Plus, it's, right. but, I mean, that's not she, socially acceptable. So that she like had sex without like, outside of wedlock. Okay. So what's the problem with that? That she will get not acceptable. Isn't it? There you go. She'll get stoned. It's not acceptable, yes. No, 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 but you, it, it goes back, no, 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 because, okay, because it, it's a big deal. It, there's a big difference between, because think about this, right? The, all right. To, to answer Chris, because she, she's betrothed to Joseph, and that word betrothed would mean that they are uh, going to be married, right? So, um, I mean, there might be a tradition that's different than that, that's just fine, but within the scripture it's saying she's, she's betrothed to him. Now, the issue here is, all right, here's his dilemma. The girl he's going to get married to is pregnant. What are his options? He tells. Okay, he gets married to her first, right? And he has some other guy's son, right? 
what now the other only issue is that you know he would have to be afraid of like her running away and disgracing him and going to live with the other guy whatever it is right so but he has one option he can marry her right what's the second option exposes her what's the problem with exposing her she gets stoned she gets she dies so basically he would have the death of someone and a child because of what he does so his action will re result in someone's death. Think about that. Your action will result in someone's death. So it's either you live a lifelong fear and lifelong, you know, you're not sure what's going on, the unknown. Then there's the fear of killing someone. And now what else is, what, what is his option that he's initially thinking about? He's going to silently break it off. So that she doesn't get in trouble, he doesn't get in trouble, and he can just get away from this whole mess, right? That seems like the best thing. Wipes his hand clean and just try to get away from this. What you what what place? I mean, Joseph is in a place of decision, of this very difficult decision, and that is what he has. It's a fear of making the right decision, right? Fear of making the right decision. Is he going to make the right decision? What is the right decision? How many of you guys have ever been in that place? I know, like when you're trying to choose for the high school high school guys, you guys are trying to choose a, a college to go to, right? <laughs> Do you choose this one or that one? Because if you go to this one, you know it might be a party school and you're not going to get like where you want to go, <laughs> or it might be, or you go to this school and you might like not like it there and things might go bad, and your whole life is now dependent upon what school you choose to go. And it's a big decision. For, the, for those in college who are undecided, and you're like, what is my major? What do I do? Your whole life is dependent upon it, and so this decision becomes very difficult. So, <laughs> so uh, that's Joseph. Finally, the shepherds, right? St. Luke chapter 2, verses 9 to 10, right? So, it, it says, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good, good tidings of great joy, which will be to you all. What are the shepherds afraid of? And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the, the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to you all. Will be to all. What do you guys think? Shepherds are afraid of what? Bad tidings? Huh? Bad tidings? Bad tidings? Okay. I was going to say, like, bad news. Bad they're news. afraid that they're going to be, like, that the angels that give them, like, news that will bring them or destroy them. Okay, or, or destroy them. <laughs> well, what what about what is it about an, a shepherd? What, what what is a shepherd's job? To take care of the sheep. To what? To take care of the sheep. To take care of the sheep. Okay, so when you take care of something, what does it involve in taking care of something? Not talking to angels. Not to, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're not doing the job, huh? <laughs> no. Okay. okay. It's a. Uh, Taking care of someone, okay, um, how do you guys have a little brother or sister? Right? Now, say your little brother or sister gets bullied by someone. What's your responsibility? Huh? To? Take care of them. To protect them, right? So the, the shepherd's job is, to, is to, to, to protect, right? To protect the sheep, to take care of them. Now, let's look at this. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. What is the, uh, what is the shepherd thinking at this time? Can the shepherd take an angel? Imagine this, all right? All right? So imagine, you know, this flying creature is above you, and just it's exuding this light and and it's the middle of the night, you're sleeping, and this thing just comes and wakes you. Now, when, he, when the shepherd's sleeping, 
it's ready to wake up to protect the sheep from what? Danger. From danger, like from wolves and from, you know, so from foxes, from these things, right? But then all of a sudden, what wakes them up is not a wolf or a fox, but something that's different. So that difference and that fear goes to them because they have no escape. It's all around them. The glory of the Lord shone all around them. So these men who were all about protection, protecting what they have and taking care of everything, they had one great fear. And that fear is a fear of failing. Fear of failing to do what they were called to do. Right? So here are the different fears that I, I was seeing. And one of the things that, before, as, we, as we go on, one of the things as we have to go back to is to figure out what is fear. So how do we define fear? Any ideas? Define fear. Huh? Your worst nightmare. Your worst nightmare. Okay. What does that mean? Say, say it louder. Oh, that's pretty good. Wait, I, I, I hear. Element of surprise. Element of surprise. Okay, that's good. That's good. Sorry, I was listening to Justin Bieber too much and rocking my car, and then my ears not. <laughs> What you don't think you can handle? Okay. Handle, handle. Handle, handle. Okay. Oh, what, you don't think you can handle? Perfect. Okay. God, God uh, leads his people by love. The devil leads his captives by fear. Okay. That's why God in the book of Romans says he, he did not give us the spirit of fear for bondage, but he gave us a spirit of love, uh, wisdom, and power. That's beautiful. That's, that's right on. Is it like a, an emotion that comes over you when um, like you're unsure of what's to come? Okay. Kind of like the, the going back to the unknown thing. Yeah. So, I think we're all hidden, hidden it. Like, we all know what fear is. But to define it, we know that feeling. We know what it is. But one of the cool things is, in the, in the scripture, all four of these, uh, of, of these passages, that word that do not be afraid, it comes from the same, it's the same word used over and over again in Greek. And that word is phobos. So phobos, that Greek word phobos, has a, a origin. And that origin, the word phobos, is, it basically means, the root word for this word phobos, which is what fear is in Greek, phobos means to flee, to separate, or withdraw. So when you say that <coughs> Satan uses fear, Satan is also called the divider. So Satan divides us, and he causes that disunity. So he does it by causing us to flee, to separate, and to withdraw. So fear is about fleeing from something. It's about separating from something. It's about withdrawing, to pull yourself away, to be out of oneself, so that you are no more who you, like, you don't have the confidence that you once had. You are pulled back, right? So that if that's what fear is, if that's what fear is, fear separates us from God. Correct? If fear separates from us from God, when we have to answer the question of how does the, the phrase, do not be afraid, work with the incarnation? It works because the incarnation is the union of God and man. So for God and man to come together, then that is Jesus Christ. That is the incarnation. And this unity cannot be found in fear. Okay? So when, um, 
the reason why the scripture is going over and over and over again to say, do not be afraid, it's to say that these people, Zechariah, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, who were all active participants in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, in the birth of our Lord and Savior, these people, they needed to remove themselves from fear. They needed to unify themselves in love. And when they are not afraid, if fear is about withdrawing oneself, then you're never going to come to union with God. But if you take fear out and you only have love, then you unify with God. You move towards God and you allow God to move towards you. So the incarnation needs for us to overcome our fear. The other cool thing about this is just looking at the development. These phrases, do not be afraid, when you look at the story of Zechariah to Mary to, to uh, Joseph to the shepherds, right? They're all showing us progression. And here's this progression, right? So Zechariah says, you know, when the angels come to Zechariah saying, do not be afraid, there's this fear of unworthiness. But God has made us worthy. I see Zechariah as um, as a, a, a unbeliever. I see Zechariah as a person who, like many of us, that we might be born and raised uh, in the Orthodox Church, thinking that we know everything, and you know. But you know what? Sometimes we don't really believe. We just do what we got to do. We come to church, we do our thing, but we don't really necessarily hold it true. Or maybe we do, and maybe we have done something in our lives that keeps us apart from God. Maybe we have done some great sin that keeps us away and makes us feel unworthy. You've done such a great sin that when you walk into the church, you feel like St. Mary of Egypt and you're, you're blocked from, the, from entering the church. You feel separated. <coughs> but God has made us worthy. And that's what Zachariah had learned. So you go from a person who feels unworthy to realize that they are worthy. And you go to Mary, who now realizes she's a person who knows that God has blessed her. She's, she, she's, she's worthy. She is humble. She, she has what she needs. She's like many of us who are sitting here. Because you guys, you guys came to Bible study. That means what? That means that you know that you know, there's a reason to be here. So the thing is... You might be facing something in your life where you're not sure what the unknown is. You're not sure where to go. The thing is, God is light. And He will help us to, to get through the unknown. And then that goes to Joseph. Joseph, who had a fear of a decision. And we have a fear of decision. We have a fear of a decision every day. To follow Christ or not to follow Christ to fast during the, fa the Lenten season or not to fast. To do what we want to do, like Friday night, good night to go out and go party out somewhere else or come to church. Do I follow the world or do I follow Christ? Do I follow my friends and do I follow popularity or do I follow, follow God? The fear of the decision, right? And finally, it comes to the shepherds who, people who have taken a responsibility to go forward, to love those that they are entrusted with, to love what they do. We, hopefully, are like the shepherds. People who want to go forward. And we've been, we, 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 we put our, we, 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 we have, decided to follow Christ. We have decided to go forward. But you know what the thing is? When we follow Christ, we, we often think, am I going to fail? Am I going to be able to live up to this? Am I going to be able to do everything He wants me to do? And the thing is, God is the true shepherd. And He will protect us. He will help us to get through. Right? So I just love how that progression happens within the chronology. 
that you come from a person who was was having difficulty believing, a person who then you, you take this progression of faith, a faith from conquering fear after fear after fear after fear, and then what arises? What arises when you conquer fear after fear after fear? You meet God. There is nothing to fear but God. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So when you stop fearing everything except for God, then He is with you. He is Emmanuel. What's the word Emmanuel mean? The name Emmanuel. God is with us, right? God is with us. God is incarnate. We have to conquer that fear and we have to overcome our fears. Fear blocks us from loving God and others. Today we heard the saddest news of the death uh, or the, the, the tragedy that happened at this elementary school in Connecticut. And it happens that fear takes over us. I know after the shooting at the, at the, the movie theater, uh, you know, it was difficult to even walk into a movie theater. And for anyone who has kids, to imagine sending your kids to elementary school where it's not safe, there's a fear. But if we allow the fear to keep us, to, to block us, we won't be able to accomplish anything. <coughs> right now is a great time, Christmas time, to go out and do charity work. <coughs> the thing is, a lot of us are afraid. We walk out and we're walking in the street and we, we might see a, a, a person who is homeless. And our modern mentality is to be afraid of them. What if they are on some medication and, you know, what, what do we do? You know, I was uh, training a bunch of uh, um, a bunch of youth. We have um, we have our own kind of like mini leadership camp for uh, in a national sense. So it was it was these servants who come from all over. It was about twenty of them, and we were all in Detroit. And so we did this three day training session, and then afterwards, and I, during that training session, I told them I would like us to go out and do like go out and go into the streets and talk to people and and, and really evangelize in a way. So one of my fearless uh, servants, um, youth, youth servants, where we, we decided to go walk through the city, city of Detroit. We wanted to tour it. We had no plan of doing anything, but he decided to go up to many different people and take my, my words advice. So he went up and started talking to people, and most people would walk away from him. And there was this one guy who, who saw our group and started following us. And so my friend thinking, oh, he's following us. He, God must have brought him. So he goes over <laughs> and talks to him. And he says, hey, come to, come to lunch with us. We're going to go to this, this nice place because Detroit's famous for their hot dogs, right? So we, we were going to go get some hot dogs. And, and it was, it was uh, we went to this, this place. They, they call it the Coney Island hot dogs, even though it's not Coney Island. It makes no sense. But they were there. And, and so... I didn't see this person. This person walks in behind all of the kids. And mind you, I am the oldest person there. And these kids are all in college. Like, so um, I'm a little worried. I'm thinking, you know, what's going to happen? So all of a sudden, this, the guy comes over, and, and I shake his hand. And as he sh I shake his hand, I see that he has one of those medical wristbands. And I, I just, I'm like, OK. I'm like, why don't you sit with me? <laughs> And, and to be honest, uh, I started talking to him. I found out that uh, he, he's, he's diagnosed with schizophrenia. And so my mind is going, oh, my God, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> and, you know, so there's a fear. But was I – now, I'm thinking this whole time i got to protect my youth. I've been entrusted with them. But – and my youth are now also afraid because they're sensing it from me. But we eat dinner, that, that lunch, and we, 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 we decide to leave. And uh, I, I shake the guy's hand. I give him a, a few dollars and say, you know, do you need anything else? Do you need any help? And he's like, oh, 
And at this point, I'm just trying to separate. I'm just trying to say, why don't you stay here and not, we'll get out. And you know, the crazy part that happens is, as I'm trying to push this guy off and say, hey, we're going to go, we'll see you. He tells me, well, I tell him, hey, we have to go. We have to go back to our church, and um, I, we, need, we need to get going. So we'll see you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Yeah, if you need anything, um, you know, uh, we can point you in the right direction and give you wh whatever you need. And he, he looks at me and says, I really only need some friends. And at that, it, it hit. It hit that one of the things that this guy needed was love. But the fear that I had was blocking that love. And that fear always drives us. So, um, drives us away from loving God and others. So during this time, I know, be careful when you go out and talk to different people. But at the same time, realize that we're called to be different. We're called to be people that, that have that love. And when we bring that love that is without fear, what happens? We witness God to those people. We make God present and alive to those people. I'm going to leave you guys with this... Uh, um, there's a new book from St. Vladimir's on the Syriac, um, Syriac writings. And so these are some of the earliest writings, and this is an anonymous poem. And within um, Syrian Orthodox and Indian Orthodox liturgy, one of the things that they have is um, all of our prayers are, there's like these special prayers where, where the writers, like Ephraim, will write about like, he'll, he'll completely take a scriptural conversation and like make it into a whole song. So this is not written by Ephraim, it's anonymous. Um, we don't know who wrote it, but this was, this, and there's this poem that goes back and forth between the angel Gabriel and Mary. And at one point in this poem, in, the, in this prayer really, it says, Mary says, I too quake, sir, and am terrified. Yet though I fear, I find it hard to believe since nature itself can well convince me that virgins do not ever give birth. So Mary, in her fear of the unknown, and the angel then responds, It is the Father's love which has so willed, that in your virginity you should give birth to the Son. It is appropriate you should keep silent and have faith too, for the will of the Father cannot be denied. So fear is overcome by the Father and His love. So during the season of the Incarnation, during the season that we remember the birth of Christ, the nativity of our Lord, we, we have to remember that this is a time of comfort, of joy, of peace. And it is a, this, this, one of my favorite songs of God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day. The idea that we are to put fear away from us and to be with love and peace and joy. And in that, the Word becomes flesh. Do not be afraid, and Christ will be with you. For He is the Emmanuel. Right? So, um, with that, are there any questions? <clears throat> We have time for just like one or two questions if, if there are no. I think we, we will never uh, enjoy real peace of God unless God give us victory or triumph over sin because the relationship between, as you indicated, <coughs> the relationship between sin and fear is the same as cause and effect. Mm -hmm. So if we are dealing with fear, we should uh, 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 look at it from the prospect of being a result of sin. So our battle is with sin. 
we have to ask God all the way to help us overcome our sins and the result will be the union with God and his uh, gracious uh, peace. The thing is, I agree with you, but Christ is already victorious. And he has given us victory in o over death and sin. And all and, and our responsibility is to, to go forward and to, to live a life that is, is worthy of him. But at the same time, he also makes us worthy. So it is a dichotomy. There, 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 is, there is this within, I mean, uh, the fear, we have to overcome, you're right, the fear of, of that unworthiness. We have to overcome our sin. But our, we will always be sinners. And we will always, um, we, we're, we are washed in the blood of Christ. We are sanctified in, in, in our continued progression towards him. Right? Yeah, but uh, let me explain something. Uh, there is difference, big difference, between being a sinful person and sometimes I repent. And being a repentant and sometimes I fall. Yes, I agree. So, if, if I am... Uh, I am in God, abide in God. I should be knowing no sin. Like uh, St. John said in his epistle, those who are born of God do not sin. Right. Meaning do not stay sin. sin. I agree, definitely. Glory to God.